Good evening, everyone. I call the City Council meeting, Committee of the Whole, uh, meeting for Wednesday, November 18th, to order. Uh, at this time, we'll have a moment of silence. Let's try and remember all the folks that are dealing with COVID. They all get better and healthy. And especially recently, we've had a few folks pass. Um, so let's remember those. Moment of silence, please. Thank you. If Alderman Dunn would be kind enough to lead us in the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alderman Dunn. Brian, if you would call the roll for this evening. Dunn. Here. Dorman. Here. McGinnis. Here. Lee. Here. Grip. Here. Condon. Here. Peacock. Peacock. Dickman. You can't hear him. We didn't hear him. He's, I see him on the screen. <laughs> Try it again. Peacock. He's waving at me. Okay. <laughs> Joked in. Here. And Ambrose. Here. Ten present, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so protocol, we're in the environment of spread out right now. So just simply, please be kind to each other, respectful for each other. If you have cell phones, please put them on silent or turn them off so they don't, you know, go off when we're having discussions. Uh, we'll be respectful for you. Please be respectful for us. Um, and if you have something, please come to the podium. You'll see our nice communication thing sitting on the podium. Um, you have five minutes uh, to talk. Please address us as a body, not as an individual. So I thank everyone for participating this evening. Uh, Ms. Spiegel, City Administrator, anything this tonight? Just a reminder that in observation of Thanksgiving next week, city facilities will be closed Thursday and Friday, and we also switch the city council meeting to Tuesday evening uh, so everybody can spend Wednesday at home. Thank you for that decision. So next Tuesday, everybody, remember, if you want to do city council, here we are Tuesday. Um, communications and petitions are next. Just a couple things for me. As everybody's aware, paying attention, hearing from everywhere, huge strain COVID's putting on our hospital system. So um, please wear a mask, please social distance. Our healthcare workers, our hospitals need your support more than ever right now. Everybody does, but especially those folks where the strain uh, and staffing is critical uh, right now. One update for everyone on our police recruiting. So that that's complete. Um, we're happy to announce we've uh, offered to uh, employment to six folks. Um, they've all accepted, so their start date will be December 28th, and they will enter the police academy on January 4th. At the same time, we have started the next round of police or winter recruiting for police. So again, I ask everyone that's listening and everybody that knows somebody, um, please find folks, please sponsor them, get them to the test sites, get them to the orientation sites, and we will put out, again, uh, multiple workshops and orientation uh, events for people to um, uh, participate in. But, but we need your help, please, to find people, uh, get them interested, and then when I say sponsor, I mean that you actually go with them and, and, and take them and make sure they show up. And again, we are starting right away. That should tell you something, that we need more folks. So. We have six that are starting into the academy, but everybody knows the academy is multiple month long procedure. That's why we're starting again. So um, thank you for that. And uh, let's see who we got. I, uh, Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Honor. Corey, a couple things. I've had several small business owners reach out to me and ask who's gonna enforce the governor's mandates. 
So we got direction from the county attorney, Mike Walton, that kind of through the law process uh, that it becomes uh, the role of local law enforcement. We will not be sending the police in to fine or enforce. Uh, we will treat it as an educational opportunity about what the current guidelines are. Okay. And the other thing is, I don't know if you can answer this, but the water company is doing a lot of work north of the Duck Creek at Washington Street. Do you have an idea what's going on there? Or is public works? I don't, but we'll find out and get back to you. Okay. And then how about an update on the riverfront bike path is coming along pretty nice now and, you know, for maybe next council meeting. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Alderman Ambrose. Alderwoman Lee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank Rich and Laura. They have stepped up. I had an issue with a, um, a constituent who was very frustrated and didn't know where to turn on um, getting some work done for his business, and his business was already stressed. Within 48 hours, we went from first email to a solution after an on-site meeting. Um, so I just really want to thank them for, for all their, their interest and their, their work to see this through a, uh, a really good solution where he can move forward at a reasonable cost. Um, I also want to thank Nicole and Rich and all the staff because I have a lot of challenging water issues in my ward. And, um, it may take a while, but we're working on getting a lot of them addressed. Uh, even if it's on private property, we're working with them so that we can help them think through solutions uh, and how it relates to city infrastructure as well. So I just wanted to throw out some, um, some gratitude to the folks I've been working with. Um, I also, here's my, my COVID update. Um, I want to support what the mayor said about the hospitals are stressed. Um, but businesses are stressed, we're stressed. Um, we are still, according to John Hopkins, we are still above 50% positive rate uh, compared to 10% in uh, the U.S. as a whole. I mean, that's pretty outrageous, 50%. Um, we've got 707 schools that are either in quarantine or have outbreaks. And that's out of 1,500 schools. So almost half of our schools in Iowa have some kind of outbreaks or quarantine. And we've got teachers that are trying to teach under those conditions, both in, in school as well as trying to do it um, off, off, well, online. Our uh, positive cases are up. Our um, number of cases reported are up. Hospitalizations are up 96%. So, and we're losing staff to COVID. They're, they're having to um, get out of the hospital. So I just want to reinforce, please, wear your mask. Don't go out unless you have to. Stay six feet away. Take this seriously. You know, at 50%, you can assume if there's three of you, you know, you can look to your right or your left or one of them's infected and it might be you even if you don't have symptoms. So there's my, my COVID report. Um, I also, I have a question or two for, for Chief Sikorsky. Chief, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Did you hear Miss Lee? Chief, this is Alderwoman Lee. And I've got a couple of questions. Um, congratulations on the six recruits. What are the uh, demographics of those recruits? Can you share that with us, please? Um, yes, uh, they're all male. Um, I believe we have one uh, African-American and at least one Asian, uh, along with all other Caucasians. Uh, there may be two Asians, actually, uh, but uh, that's where we're at. Chief, we have... Okay. Hey, Ms. Lee, we have three Caucasian, one African-American, one Hispanic, and one Asian. Oh, Thank okay. You. Yep. Thank you. And then one other thing, I know I sent an email to you about this, but I'd also like to just bring it up for the public as well. Um, you saw that the next door 
where somebody said, do not, well, I recommended that they call 911 about a robbery. And someone came up and said, do not use 911 because that's only for emergencies. And I, of course, quoted you and quoted Sergeant Harris saying, no, that helps you track and, and 911 is no longer just for emergencies. Um, so I think we need to get the word out. You know, us older folks, we were trained, never call 911 unless somebody's dying, basically, or the house is on fire. And that's not true anymore with your um, with the new center that we've got. And it really does help you track. So I'd really like to recommend that we get word out that 911 is basically for anything like that. Is yeah, we use we add? sure we use uh, we use 911 to facilitate any response from public safety. So whether that's police, fire, or medic, <clears throat> and it's not always an emergency response to incidents. So we use uh, that uh, communication as a primary communication to get a uh, public safety response to anywhere in our city. Yes, and I just think we need to get the, the word out more on that. People, oh, there's so many people that, that think 911 is just for emergencies and don't bother them otherwise, but that's not the case anymore. Yep, if, if people uh, need the police response for anything, 911 is the way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm done. Thank you, Alderwoman Lee. Alderman Peacock. Can everybody hear me now? We can. Thank you so very much. Actually, this is a test. I just want to really test my audio. But I will say thank you to Nicole and her team with uh, Public Works once again doing an outstanding job with uh, all the or work they have going on and keeping me abreast. Thank you so very much. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Peacock. Anyone else? I'm pausing. Very good. We'll move on then. Um, action items for discussion. We have our four areas. The first one is community development. We have no items on that agenda tonight, so we'll move to the public safety. Alderman Ambrose and Alderman Jobson. Alderman Ambrose, please. Thank you, Honor. The first item on the discussion is a second consideration ordinance amending section 10.74.050 entitled Muffler Prevention of Noise and section 9.20.030 entitled Trespassing, Municipal Code of the City of Davenport. Anybody from the public? Council? And the next item is a motion approving beer and liquor license. We don't go through those, but those will be on our social media platform if anybody wants to look into them. And I'd ask Alderman Jobjian to set the agenda. Mr. Ambrose, Ms. Uh, Lee has a comment. Yes, Alderwoman Lee. Yes, first of all, I'd like to remind people to slow down a little bit. It takes us a while to push our button, <laughs> okay, or to type in something on chat. Um, I just wanted to say I wish this was passed now because I, I was going down Harrison Street behind a truck with a very noisy muffler and I was happy to see a police squad car come up next to it and follow it for a while, but there was nothing they could do because it's not in place yet. But um, I think that we're going to do some good things with this one. I just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alderwoman Lee. Alderman Jobjian. Well, with that, I will make a motion that item one be placed on the discussion agenda for next week so we can look to suspend the rules and item two be placed on the consent agenda. I have a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you, Your Honor. Aye. Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. Uh, the next area is Public Works. Alderman Dunn and Alderman Dorman will talk about that. Alderman Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. We have 11 items this evening for Public Works. Item number one is a resolution accepting the sanitary sewer, storm sewer, and pavement associated with the Sang Meadows first edition site improvements. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing none, that item will move on. Item number two is a resolution accepting the construction of the FY20 IDOT threshold street resurfacing project completed by Hawkeye Paving of Davenport, Iowa in the amount of $584,034.85. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council. 
Seeing none, this item will move on. <clears throat> item number three is a resolution approving the contract for the Public Works Facility Lobby Upgrade Project Precision Builders of Bettendorf, Iowa in the amount of $292,224. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing none, this item will move on. I have a comment. I, I have a comment. Older okay. woman Lee, is that you? Um, Rick, I was wondering if we could um, kind of combine, not for your purposes, but for mine, four through 10, and have Rich come up and just talk a little bit about the assessment process for the weeds and boarding and brush and debris and snow removal and sidewalk repair, uh, repairs, tree removal and cost of um, condemned property demo. I can say it, property demolition. I don't know if you want to do it now or if you want to do it at the end, but I would like him to come up. What I tell you what, how about I'll read items four through 10 and then we'll have discussion. How's that? That sounds good. Thank Perfect. You. Item number four is a resolution accessing the cost of weed cutting at various lots and tracts of real estate. Item number five is a res resolution assessing the cost of boarding up buildings at various lots and tracts of real estate. Item number six is a resolution accessing the cost of brush and debris removal at various lots and tracts of real estate. Item number seven is a resolution accessing the cost of snow removal from sidewalks at various lots and tracts of real estate. Item number eight is a resolution accessing the cost of sidewalk repair at various lots and tracts of real estate. Item number nine is a resolution accessing the cost of tree removal at various lots and tracts of real estate. And item number 10 is a resolution assessing the cost of condemned property demolitions at various lots and tracts of real estate. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address any of these items? And Ms. Lee, would you like to comment now or would you want to have them? Yes, yes, thank you, Alderman Dunn. Um, I would like to ask Rich to come up and just talk about this program a little bit. Um, um, how do you decide which ones to take care of? Um, what are some of your factors? What, what are the amounts, uh, what, what's the rate of uh, reimbursement, these assessments? Just, just a little bit about the program, thank you. Mr. Oswald Aljan. He Tom, said he'd be available to talk about. This is Rich. Can you hear me? Right. Yep, he's on now. Okay. Yep, got it. We can hear you. All right. So, uh, on most of these uh, are driven by notice and order and city ordinance. So, um, if you know, a complaint comes in for somebody hasn't cut their grass, removed debris or bushes, uh, shovel their sidewalks, repair them appropriately. They'll receive notice and order from the city to have those fixed. Um, if they fail to comply, we will then have city contractors go in and complete this work. And then that work is uh, billed back to the property owner. Um, if they fail to pay that bill after 60 days, then it is put forward to an assessment on the property. Um, as far as the sidewalks and debris and, and grass, those are complaint driven or enforcement driven. Um, you know, as you know, like if your grass is taller than nine inches, you get a notice or just a legal accumulation of debris, um, and that you will receive notice on that. Um, for the demolitions, which are a little more involved, we track and uh, follow our vacant and abandoned properties. Um, as a staff, we go through and look at those properties um, for a different, couple of different criteria. Um, public safety, obviously, um, is it is it an endangerment to the neighbors? of activity at the property, so police or enforcement activities, or are we constantly going there, boarding it up, taking care of it, and, and just the overall location. And that's how we select those. And then those are individually bidded out, and then that cost of the demolition is put back through an assessment on the property. Rich, um, this is Alderwoman Lee. Uh, of what proportion of assessments are repeat offenders? Uh, you know, I don't have that on hand. Um, we do have some repeat offenders. Um, I can get that information if, if you want it at a later date. Okay, th that's fine. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Anyone else? Seeing none, this item will move on. Item number 11 is a motion accepting the construction of the North Pine Street sidewalk, 6240 North Pine, 
to 63rd Street by Hawkeye Paving Corporation in the amount of $57,276.55. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing none, this item will move on. And Alderman Dorman, would you please set the agenda for us? Thank you, Alderman Dunn. I move to place all items on the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And that concludes public works for this evening, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Dunn. The next and last area is finance. And if it's okay with Alderman Condon, um, Alderwoman McGinnis will um, read those, and then Alderman Peacock will set the agenda. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, number one, um, item one is a second consideration. It's an ordinance amending section 15.08.215 entitled Combined Code Board of Appeals Powers and Duty by amending subsection A. Is there anyone with the public with comment? Anyone from council? This item will move on. Uh, the second item, a resolution providing for reduction of interest rate on taxable sewer revenue bonds, series 2010, uh, Build America bond direct payment. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to comment? Anyone from council? This item will move on. Number three, resolution naming the N5 lot of Main Street Landing, Quinlan Corp. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment? Anyone from council? Madam Chair. Yes, I'm sorry. Alderman Ambrose. Is there some logic to Quinlan Court? Alderman Grip, would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the mayor had tasked uh, Alderwoman McGinnis, Alderman Condon, and myself to uh, kind of look into uh, the, the history of our fine city downtown and riverfront and come up with a name for uh, the N5 flex lot that was appropriate. Um, we really evaluated uh, famous uh, people who had an impact on our riverfront, uh, famous boats, street names, et cetera. And then uh, the suffixes like uh, court and uh, um, plaza and, and things of that nature. And uh, we decided on uh, Quinlan Court, uh, the, the uh, SS Quinlan boat uh, was the boat that I believe it was produced in Rock Island, uh, took ferry trips between Rock Island and uh, the downtown. I believe the, the boat ended up uh, uh, burning down mm -hmm. in Rock Island at one point. But anyways, there's a great I remember the day. Okay. <laughs> it's probably it was probably It was during his first term on council. Um, but anyways, we thought it was a, it was a good homage uh, both to our city's history and our city's riverfront. Is anybody else with comment? Alderman Dunn. I just want to say thank you. That sounds a lot better than N5 lot. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, seeing no one, this item will move on. Item number four is a resolution approving payment of $144,648 to Tyler Technologies of Falmouth, uh, Maine for the annual licensing of the MUNA software system for the period November 1, 2020 to October 31st, 2021. Is there anybody from the public with comment? And I believe Alderman uh, Lee has a, a question about this or a comment. Alderman Lee? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, would someone explain what the software is for? Alderman Lee, this is Corey. It's our enterprise financial system, so it handles all of our AP revenue modeling, et cetera. AP revenue? Please explain that. It's our financial modeling system, so it handles all of the city's finances. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, this item will move on. Number five is a resolution awarding a contract for the six, for 600, 637 Oak Street Rehabilitation Project to River Valley Homes of Bettendorf, Iowa, in the amount not to exceed 
$253,254. Is there anyone for the public with comment? Um, and before I move on to the council, um, is um, Bruce Berger available to, thank you, Bruce, I didn't see you back there. Um, if Bruce would you kind of go over um, this project and why we're doing it and, and also the cost, which is substantial. Sure. Okay, we talk to you, right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so uh, Bruce Berger, uh, Community and Economic Development. This is uh, a property for our urban homestead program. And um, so many of you may know um, that's where it's typically an abandoned home um, that the city would acquire. We would hire contractors to fix up the property and then we would sell it to low to moderate income home buyers. All the money that we use for it is federal in nature. In this case, it's home funds. And home funds, some of the reason for the cost, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I think at least maybe one alderman had a question about that as well. Um, admittedly, you know, that's more than we might spend in terms of what we can sell it for. But the cost of using all those federal funds um, does trigger a lot of different criteria. So certain contractors have to have certain uh, certifications. Um, a lot of times we, you know, we'll go well beyond. It will be a complete gut rehab, um, and and we have to put in a lot of new major systems, and that prevents the homeowner from who's low to moderate income from having major expenses in the first few years of their ownership. So. It's been a model that's been pretty effective. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any other questions, I guess. I got one. I, I, Alderman Lee had, I had her run first. I'm sorry, Alderman Amherst. Alder, uh, Alderman Lee. Thank you, Marion, and thank you, Bruce. Um, I will say that, that both, I, I had a long discussion with both Bruce and just before the meeting with Alderman McGinnis, uh, which was very helpful. Um, you saw my questions on it. it was so much money compared to what the house was worth. But I do have a question for Bruce. Um, looking at realtor.com, which shows you pictures of the inside of houses, this one is already gutted. It's already down to the studs. And, and really all you saw was um, a couple of piles of new drywall leaning up against studs. So what, uh, what has the city already spent to do the demolition that would then lead to 250,000 in federal funds for the actual um, retrofit and reconstruction. I'll, I don't know exactly what we've already spent on the property. I mean, we acquired it, um, but I can I can get that information to you. As far as you know, if you'd like a, a list of the types of things we spend it on, I can get you a little bit of a summary on that as well. It's usually the major systems. <laughs> Um, will end up costing quite a bit. There, there is a lead remediation that we have to do because we're spending more than 25,000 in federal funds on it. And so that triggers a number of uh, clearance activities and, and lead-based paint uh, abatement activities that we have to do room by room. So, but yeah, I can get you a little bit of a summary of that before next week, if that works. And, and one other question, Bruce, thank you. I, I'll look forward to that. One other question is, uh, you mentioned that there were a limited number of contractors who could do some of the environmental abatement work. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, so um, the, without going into too much detail, there's a number of certifications that one has to have to meet the standard of doing this category of work under HUD's federal guidelines. And because there aren't a lot of federally funded projects in, in areas our size um, like that, there's really only a couple of contractors around that do it. And so, and part of the reason for that is there's specialized equipment that they need to have. There are, um, that's expensive. There are also those certification and trainings have to go for each of their staff members. And so it's, you know, supervisors have a certain level and, and uh, certain workers have, have different levels of training. And all of those things add up to, as you might imagine, time away from work for contractors. And when there aren't a lot of projects out there for the contractors to do, um, it's not super beneficial to have lots and lots of contractors that have that. So as a result, yeah, there aren't, there aren't too many contractors around that are able to, to perform this work. Something we're actually talking about um, working on with uh, some of our economic development funds. Maybe we can try to encourage, you know, a, another contractor or two to go through all that process because there's, there's certainly work out there if we, can, if we can get their attention. But anyway, yeah, that's the, the quick summary. Alderman Lee, do you have your questions answered? Well, I actually had one more, and to, just to, to build on what he said at the last 
Um, there are so many houses in Davenport that are old that I'm sure it would behoove a lot of contractors to get some of that certification. It's not only federal requirements, it's federal law about lead abatement, lead paint, anything built before 1978, asbestos in a lot of these old homes. So I, I would like to encourage the city to encourage um, more training for a lot of contractors because it would behoove them for a lot, the work that they do for retrofitting old homes, you know, like Marion was telling me before. There's a lot of them here. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bruce, the process of choosing a house, you know, they do a great job when they tackle a house, but as I go up and down some of our gateways, we have high profile properties that I believe should be targeted before others. But can you share the process of picking a property out? Uh, certainly, it, it, and it's, um, and I, you're, you're, you're definitely right in that there's a, there's a lot of candidates out there. The challenge we have, and uh, maybe a, a little bit akin to Goldilocks, um, we do have low to moderate income buyers. Did you say? Goldilocks. Goldilocks, yeah. yeah. The mask is. Um, there, there are. We have low to moderate income home buyers who are the end users of these properties, and we'll be acquiring them. And if it's too large of a house, depending on the household size, which which we can't regulate in terms of who we sell to um, by federal rule, the, um, the the cost of maintaining that home, if it's too large to heat it, cool it, taxes on it, and those things. Um, can set them up for failure. And by the same token, um, you know, there's a need to uh, acquire um, larger homes yet for some families out there. And so we, we try to have a good balance of two, three, and four bedroom homes available for folks. And then also, as we just talked about, there are fairly high costs to be able to comply with all the federal standards. And there's a cap on how much we can spend on the federal dollars that HUD sets. So as a result, we can't acquire them for very much. And so we need to, and a lot of times they're donated or we're acquiring them at fairly low value. So it's those are the challenges we run into. Sometimes we can't find the owner, just like um, I know a number of, of redevelopers have too. And so that's a challenge. Um, and other times people can move in more quickly and acquire homes more quickly than the city can because of some of our processes. So all of those things add up to it's we, we can't always just get out and get the exact one we want. But if you have properties in mind, I would definitely say, you know, shoot them our way. We'll, we'll take a look. So, yep. Anything else? Is anybody else? Alderman Dunn. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, this is a not to exceed price. So we do have staff that looks at the invoices and make sure everything's yep. perfect. Thank yep. you. Anybody else? Anyone else? Uh, Bruce, also, would you talk just a little bit, not to belabor this, but there's been quite an amount of reinvestment in that area around West 6th Street over the last two or three years. Can you talk a little about the private investment and yes. what else we've been trying to do in sort of the area strategy? Well, and, and that's a good point, actually, even to Alderman uh, Ambrose's question. That, that was another factor in this particular property. Um, we had a developer who did the Naval Reserve or former Buchanan School uh, building, which is on the same block as this property. So... It's nice, and, and HUD encourages it, and we like to see it too when you see multiple projects in the same area and you kind of see that bigger bang for the buck. That's an area that we've, um, and with two schools nearby, um, it, it, we'd love to see that area um, uh, rebound. And so that was another factor that kind of played into it when we were out working with the, the contractor and, and supervising a home-funded rental project in that area that we saw this particular property and were able to kind of jump on it maybe more quickly than some properties when we're not out in that you know out in those blocks all the time but yeah it's a great it's a great uh, synergy that's going on we did some sidewalk work over there too um and the developer did a great job of that property and a water retention stormwater cleanup so there's there's a lot of great things going in that block so thank you bruce and and if i could just add um you i'm okay. fine thank you very much um yeah i just want to say too um you know you know, I, this is part of third ward, so maybe I'm a little biased, but I'm always happy there were several done, you know, in other wards over the last few years. And, um, you know, the, you know, I walk that ward, I walk out my ward, I knock on the doors, and um, the area I live in and to the east was pretty well, um, 
gutted and damaged uh, by it's you know years of city policies and just you know down you know up increasing density and that this was going on long before any of us were around um, and and I'm, I guess one of the things I always see about the West End the third ward and I'm sure we see it further in the West End as well as uh, you know within our core area there's a challenge in home ownership it's uh, the the core neighborhoods are about 46 percent rental. Um, and um, so this was, a, I believe, a single family home. And so I never want to see, and when I walk in the West End and I knock on doors, I see people who have lived in their homes for a long time. And I sort of, you know, sort of as alderman there, I never want to see what happened to my neighborhood happen to the West End. And so I'm excited about this. I'm so excited about everything that we've done in that area, the private investment, for Buchanan School, uh, which transformed that corner uh, in an amazing way. Um, so uh, it's 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 not the fanciest, probably the fanciest home in Davenport, but it's going to be a great home for a family. And so I'm I'm very excited to see when we're working on sections um, of any any of our wards uh, to try to bring them back up. So thank you very much for that, Bruce. So um, anyone else um, hearing no one else? Then this item will move on. Number six is a resolution approving the purchase of new furnishings for the main library from Paragon Commercial Interiors of Davenport, Iowa, in the amount of $143,458.48. Anyone from the public with comment? Council? This item will move on. Number seven is a resolution awarding a contract for the purchase of specific and aggregate stop-loss insurance to Tokyo Marine HCC in the amount of $927,153.20. Is there anyone from the public with comment? Anyone from council? Seeing no one, this item will move on. And number eight is a motion approving the submission of the City of Davenport Annual Urban Renewal Report for fiscal years 20. Anyone from the public with comment? Council? This item will move on, and uh, Alderman Peacock, would you please set the agenda? I move to, I, I move to place all items on the consent agenda. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 And then the last items uh, on finance are items that we do not vote on, but they're there for your review. These are items of uh, $50,000 or less. And that's all for finance, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderwoman uh, McGinnis. Uh, next is any other ordinances, resolutions, and motions. There are none. At this time, we'll have public with business. If anybody would like to talk to us, please come to the podium. State your name or ward. If you're not from here, we'd love you to know, we'd love you to tell us where you're from, and you'll have five minutes. Please. Sure. Mr. Hamm. Nice drive. Quite a bit of you today from Nashville this morning. Got up at 530. And got here about an hour ago. A um, couple things I want to talk about is uh, the uh, the most recent plan that the uh, Davenport Partnership put together as, as, as bequested or, you know, to the, the city of Davenport. And I, I see an article that is a good chance that it's going to be approved or going to be put up for approval to the city council next month. And uh, I just want to say that um, um, it seems like, and I may have said last time I was here, it's a good, good company, a good uh, design firm that that uh, that they retained to, to put that together. But um, as a company that I think has just only perhaps flown by our city or or spent no more than a few days and perhaps only interviewed a few people, um, given the fact that our our city's uh, future uh, is almost down tied inwardly to downtown, I think it would be a good idea for the city to. Uh, engage those fine people for its own benefit and not for the benefit of the downtown partnership. Because if you remember algebra, the Venn diagram, it was a Venn a circle for what's good for all the citizens of Davenport, what's good for the downtown Davenport partnership. Right now, it seems to me the, the theory is that they're totally conjoined, that there's no disjoint between the two. I think they're two, two separate circles. I think there are things that are good for the the downtown partnership that aren't necessarily good for the people in Davenport. Um, I mean, the, talking about Quinlan, you know, the fact that uh, a 
a ferry between our two cities, Davenport and Rock Island, is something that had been on the original um, uh, river action, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the river vision, but it, it seems to have been lost the last couple iterations of downtown plans. And uh, I think um, perhaps uh, the people in downtown Davenport don't want to see any dollars ever escaping their domain, but I think, uh, I think a, a ferry between our two cities would enhance both of our downtowns. Um, and the, in particular, the things that I want to brought up, bring up are things I've talked about at the last meeting, which are amenities to our downtown. Last, uh, last summer, Johanlon and I had uh, the opportunity to visit visiting Portland, Oregon, whose downtown has a wonderful strip of green running for five or six blocks. Uh, it's, essentially, it's a very wide right-of-way. Um, very nice. Um, People in Portland just take that as, uh, as for granted, I guess. Uh, and I think it would do our city well to look at perhaps adding green space or preserving green space in our downtown area. I talked last time, the area due south of our public library that the plan calls for more housing. I think last, uh, last year, Mr. Berger took a... He was, I have to thank him. He gave me a, a nice uh, meeting about how the, the space to the south of the River Center really was only worth about a quarter million dollars. It was flat, cleared. This space where the drive up bank, it's flat, but it's got the drive up bank that have to be demolished, and perhaps it's got environmental problems. It seems to me that's a smaller piece of land. Mr. Berger could probably make a good case that the city could purchase that, that land for 250,000 or less. And I think it would be appropriate use of those funds to create a green space right at the heart of our downtown. And uh, joining the, the library, it would be something that many of the better libraries in our country have. And uh, we, could, uh, we could really use that. The second one is, as I said last time, the ground transportation building. That thing probably has value, the city owns it, a new building of that size would be at least $10 million. And for us to cavalierly say that thing needs to come down without any um, architect or any alternative use study is just a really an outrageous waste of our, of our monies. I think given the fact that it's right next to the Figgy, the Figgy's art plaza could more than quadruple if that area were developed to tie into the Figgies Plaza. And the, the two corners right there, that cur curved area we've got right there, there. I could see restaurants right there, great views of the downtown outside of the floodplain. Um, besides that, then if we, we convert that building, where do we have our, um, our bus uh, waiting area? I think it'd be a waste to have something another three blocks away <laughs> from where we are now. Much better to take that space under that parking garage, turn it in, into that, and if you want retail, have parking, have a retail on that area just to the south of the Redstone uh, garage. Great views of the, of the river. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. real retail, thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, pausing. All right, any other reports, Ms. Spiegel? There are none. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor to adjourn. Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Social distance. Wear your mask.